Hey, what is up? Welcome to this episode of the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brian Lofermento, and I am joined by an awesome guest today. We are neighbors by roots. He is Serbian of Serbian descent. I am Albanian, so super excited to talk to him off air a little bit, but even more excited about all the incredible things that he does professionally. This guy has a strong reputation for being a geek about all the things that he does to make a positive impact on the world. So let me tell you about today's guest. His name is Konstantin Popovich. Konstantin is the founder of Impact 3P, a sustainability consultancy that ignites sustainability journeys for small, medium enterprises and drives sustainability cultures for bigger organizations. Over the last 30 years, KP, I love that nickname for him, KP has been solving business problems through creativity for famous marketing agencies, clients big and small, and across three continents. This is someone who is a world traveler. Not only does he travel, he He's lived in so many different places. He speaks multiple different languages. He's so incredibly talented at all the things he does. And I would imagine, we're going to dive into it today, that that gives him such a different perspective on the type of work that he does. In his last corporate role, KP discovered his passion for sustainability after winning the assignment for Singapore's first climate awareness campaign. From that moment forward, he knew he had to slowly switch gears. So he upskilled, defined his mission as making sustainability everybody's business business, moved back to the U.S., and got to work. And here he is today. So I'm not going to say anything else. Let's dive straight into my interview with Konstantin Popovich. All right, Konstantin, I'm so excited that you're here today. Welcome to the show. I'm excited as well. And uh, I got to tell you one thing. Uh, when I discovered your podcast, the thing that made me immediately want to be on it is your infectious energy, yeah? Because that's kind of what I live off as well, you know? Uh, and, and I think one of the um, tips that every entrepreneur uh, gives each other is like surround yourself with people with positive energy, right? And so you're one of these people, clearly. So I'm also excited to be here. So thank you for having me. Yeah? KP, I so appreciate those kind words. It's funny. So you are a Northeaster now. You're living in New York. I am originally from Boston. And people always say, you know, there's that old marketing cliche of Boston runs on Duncan. I always say and joke that I run on excitement. And it's because I get to have amazing conversations like this, Constantine. So I'm excited about this. I would love for you to take us beyond the bio, though, because I'm so fascinated by your entire journey leading up to this point. How'd you get here, Constantine? Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a couple of dimensions. So first of all, the, the personal dimension, yeah? um, you mentioned it uh, in the intro, I've lived in many places. I think uh, the roots for that uh, was seeded early on because um, my dad moved us from Serbia to Germany when I was three. Right. So I already uh, had one move in me as a, as a little kid. And um, and then even as I was growing up, uh, he went to Canada for 18 months. And so uh, we traveled a lot as a family. And this whole global mindset was instilled in me quite early on. Yeah? And uh, in full transparency, the one thing that uh, was not instilled in me early on was actually sustainability. I'll get to that. Uh, in a bit how I discovered this, but um, it was clear for me that I would be a global citizen uh, early on, right? And um, so the thing that originally drew me into advertising is uh, the creativity and the type of people and the diversity of people that you find in this industry. And sure enough, I immediately loved it. Um, I started out in Dusseldorf, Germany, and then after six years, I wanted to just experience something else. And that was at the height of the dot com boom. And uh, the uh, colleagues in Chicago said, bring it over here. And this is kind of how I got to the US. Um, and then fast forward to uh, 2015. By that time, I had moved to New York. Um, suddenly an opportunity in Singapore opens up. And so this is how we ended up spending the last eight years in Singapore. So you can see I've uh, lived in many places. I feel at home in many places and uh, anything global, working with people across cultures, across um, uh, boundaries uh, is really what I'm passionate about. Now, what you really are interested in though is kind of how does somebody 
who uh, found um, his career in advertising suddenly becomes a sustainability consultant. And it is not obvious, clearly. Um, in fact, uh, you know, some people would look at the advertising industry as an industry that isn't on the high purpose side. Uh, and, you know, that's for another day uh, to, to debate that. But it is true that I was very focused on client results, um, on creating big campaigns for big global clients. Uh, and that is what I was doing for 27 years, right? And then in the last couple of years, uh, I switched gears a little bit because I was running a local um, uh, I was running the local agency in Singapore. And when you are um, working locally in Singapore as an advertising agency, the one thing you have to do is you have to work with the government. The government is a big marketing spender in Singapore. Most people won't know this, but uh, the way they run the country is by actually, uh, you know, communicating with their people through a lot of marketing campaigns. And so uh, usually these are very, very interesting assignments. And one of the these assignments about four or five years ago was with the Ministry of Environment uh, and Sustainability. Uh, actually, we won two pitches in a row. The first one was what you mentioned uh, in the intro, which was uh, to create uh, Singapore's first uh, climate awareness campaign. Um, so by now, Singapore is quite active in that space. But back then, there was very little. And uh, they hadn't really made that a public issue. And so this was the first time we got the chance to build this together uh, with their Ministry of Environment. So that was the original spark. And I really, um, from that moment on, started to investigate into the subject. Then what happened is COVID comes in and everybody is in lockdown and looking for things to do online. And I discovered Al Gore's movement called the Climate Reality Project. And so like everybody else, they uh, had to switch from uh, offline trainings to online trainings. And so that gave me the opportunity from Singapore to participate in, in one of his trainings. So you're literally there uh, for um, a couple of days uh, listening to Al Gore. And this was uh, my big light bulb moment. And from then on, it was clear to me, I got to kind of uh, really figure this out. Uh, the beauty was that I could really test the grounds with my own agency. So I did a lot of cultural things, um, cultural transformation, bringing uh, employees along, which you know then translates to one of my pillars right now. And then we also started uh, in a client-facing unit and um, did projects with clients. So that, that was really kind of how I started to really uh, dig into it. And then at some point it was clear to me, okay, so now I really uh, want to think about what I'm going to do the next 30 years. Maybe the 30 year anniversary was like a, a pivotal moment. Um, and so I was like, okay, uh, I'm not looking for a quick buck for the next couple of years. I'm looking for how do I create impact for the next 30 years, right? And so sustainability seemed like something that A, is desperately needed. We need more people in sustainability. Um, and the second is not something that will go away tomorrow. Uh, it looked like something that I can be useful in for the next 30 years, right? So that was the transition. So um, for reasons that are not important here, we also uh, uh, paired it with the move back to the U.S., uh, but I, I love it here also in, in, in New York, I must say, and um, created Impact 3P. So um, let me ask you, Brian, a question. Do you know what the 3P stand for? That's that's one of my questions for you today, KP. Lay it on us. <laughs> okay, so um, the 3Ps um, stand for people, planet, and profit. Okay, so it was originally coined under the header of the triple bottom line. Um, and essentially, uh, what it asks uh, companies to think about is to think beyond profit. Yeah. And so, my philosophy is that um, in order for everybody to join the sustainability revolution, you have to align your impact on people, planet, and profit. Yeah? So these are not separate things, but they work hand in hand. You know, a, a simple example is if you take care of your employees, and there's many, many ways that can manifest itself, then you, this is also good for the bottom line. In the same way, it, there's enough proof now that if you really take care, uh, if you think through how you can take care of the planet as an, uh, as an organization, that will also be good for the bottom line, right? So that's kind of 
why Impact 3P. Uh, I would like to help organizations align their impact on people, planet, and profit. And that immediately flags to organizations that I'm not trying to make the moral argument, uh, which, of course, there's a lot to be set for. You know, everybody needs to do their, their part. Uh, we have a big issue at hand, and everybody uh, should um, out of intrinsic motivation do this, but we also know how organizations run. Um, you know, money rules the world, and so it's important for people to uh, look for that intersection of people, planet, and profit. Yeah, gosh, I love that overview for so many reasons, Constantine. But what really stands out to me, well, two things that I want to call out right now. One is I love how you just ended that by raising that point of this isn't a moral compass problem. This is also a profit problem. Well, it's it's really both of those. And that's such a thing that I'm embracing here in my 30s is the power of and thinking. It's not this or that. It's almost always all inclusive of and. All of these things can be true. But Constantine, the other thing that I really love of your overview overview is you come from the advertising world and you really painted that contrast. I'm certainly biased because I'm a marketer by nature. And Constantine, I would argue that most things in life have a marketing problem. And when we're talking about sustainability, my view on it is I also think that we have a marketing problem that you are aiming to solve as well because people do want to pin it on that moral question rather than where you just left it, which is that people, planet, and profit. And so on that note, as a big soccer fan, so I'm big into the English Premier League. Shout out to Manchester United, which is for sure my club. I remember when I was a kid, there was a problem within English football and there remains in, in different parts of the world with racism. And so the English Football Association launched a campaign called Kick It Out of Football. And so it was all about kicking racism out of football. Fans, players, everybody had a really sweet logo. It, it was a marketing campaign, Constantine, that had a positive message behind it. With your marketer and advertising hat on, what do you see the problems when it comes to marketing? This very important topic that I think gets swayed because of poor messaging and convoluted motives behind it. Yeah, so there's a uh, this is a big big topic you're uh, touching on it. So let's dissect it a little bit. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> the first thing that we have to remember uh, in sustainability is that it's operations first, marketing second. Yeah. And so um, the uh, the thing that we the trap we shouldn't fall into is to start with marketing. Right. Uh, we cannot campaign ourselves out of the issue. We have to first make sure that we do the hard work in uh, changing behaviors, changing operations, etc. And then talk about it, right? But what the, the second thing you're alluding to is, um, does climate change uh, as a problem have a communications issue, right? And it does. And in fact, when you ask a lot of people in the industry, they would all say, yes, it does. Um, and um, the, the main issue is that we're operating too much out of a fear-based argument. Yeah? So very often what we see in the public space is uh, images of catastrophe and ditopia and uh, even the sense of like everything is just going down and, uh, you know, we're all going to die. Yeah? And we all know from psychology that that is not usually what motivates people into action. So you have to make sure that you don't trivialize the problem, but at the same time, you have to leave things on a hopeful note. You have to leave things um, on a note that gives people um, enough hope that they actually join in the mission and become part of the solution. You know, that's essentially the balance uh, that uh, that you have to create. And you have to uh, give people a lot of different access points to actually join in and be part of the solution. You know, so these are uh, different things, right? Not too heavy on the negative, not too heavy on the heavy burden, and then also giving lots of uh options and opportunities to people to kind of join uh, join the party. Yeah, I really love the way that you answered that, Constantine, because obviously you've given so much intentional thought to it. What I really think of is you're right. When we go too far to the fear side, well, then it's a lost cause. Well, what will my efforts do anyways? And, and not to turn this into a political conversation, but we hear it in the political spectrum where people say, ah, oh, my vote doesn't matter. And, and when we make the people feel powerless, we also disincentivize them from taking any sort of action. So knowing that you are a man of very intentional words, KP, I want to ask you about the very notion 
question. I think that we really have to go here today of talking about what is sustainability? What does it actually mean to you? Because in this cloud of fear, in this cloud of, of the messaging problem, it really gets lost of what the heck does it mean for us as individuals? And especially here we are on the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast for us as business owners. Yeah. So, I mean, at the at the highest level, and so obviously there are lots of people who uh, have conversations about defining sustainability and there's some sort of official uh, definition. But for me, it is really about creating a better world. Yeah? And so that's why also I tend to not be uh, uh, just climate um, focused because that's the overarching, the biggest of the issues, but it's not the only issue we have to solve. Yeah? Um, and especially when you when you come from Asia, uh, now Singapore is a very wealthy country, but we were surrounded by countries that are still emerging. And uh, what you pick up from there is that they have other things that need solving and not that everybody in the US or UK necessarily has the best access to education or the perfect healthcare. You know, we, we have other issues in our countries as well. But when you go to these emerging markets, that's really where it hits you. Yeah? It's like it's not just all about climate change. So my uh, frame of reference for sustainability is really the 17 sustainable development goals by the UN, because they're all encompassing. And when you look at them, then you realize that it's really about a better life uh, for everybody in a better world. Yeah? And so while this feels broad, it really also means that uh, everybody can contribute to that better world in some shape or form, right? And now, of course, from there, you can then uh, dial down, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, you can like uh, dig into more specific issues of which uh, climate change definitely is the biggest one, but there's related one like, uh, you know, the pollution we're creating. And uh, on, on that note, um, you know, back to the previous conversation we had about communication. Yeah? Um, I, I grew up with Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. I've always been a huge fan of him. Yeah? And now he, in a way, is a climate hero for me. And he has some things to say to the communications problem. And he says that we should uh, abandon talking about the climate crisis and we should just talk about pollution because that's a word that everybody understands and everybody knows how to hate. Nobody likes pollution. Nobody likes polluting rivers. Nobody likes polluting our bodies. So it's a, it's a little twist on, um, on the subject. And, uh, you know, so you could also uh, put it this way. It's like if everybody can just contribute to less pollution, we will have created a better world. You know? Yeah, really well said. And I'll tell you what, as someone who lived in Los Angeles for a while, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger, it's easy. It's a visible enemy when you're in LA. When you wake up and you see that smog sitting over that city, it is that visible reminder, which I guess leads me into my next question, Constantine, which is especially for business owners. I, I love, I mean, we were talking so much about messaging today. I love your mission of making sustainability everybody's business. I think that's such a smart motto that all of us can really get on board with and that we can really understand. But what is is your what is your answer what is your advice or guidance or insights for people who it is an invisible enemy and and I'll take this question two ways one is you brought up those emerging nations if if I'm someone in it feels like a luxury for you and I to be having this conversation here in the United States but if I'm in one of the emerging countries well we are having our industrial revolution right now you and I come from the Balkans which has had its fair share of turmoil over you know, decades. And so there's that part of the question where, hey, we're just trying to do what we can to survive. And then the second part of the question is for businesses where they're so focused on saying, we got to grow, we need to make things good for our employees. That's an invisible force. Why are we going to look there when we really have these more pressing priorities? Yeah, okay. So uh, it's really two questions that we can separate out. I'll start with the emerging markets. Um, <clears throat> so there's uh, companies in Indonesia, for example, uh, and Indonesia has a massive um, pollution problem because they get all the waste in the ocean uh, that is sort of in that uh, South China Sea that all comes down uh, to their beaches. Yeah? And uh, they live a lot of tourism in some of these islands, and then you have these polluted beaches. So they need to they need to uh, figure out that problem because that problem also has an economic impact on one of their major industries, which is tourism. And then what they can do with the help of certain social enterprises is actually also create employment for people who are at the um, you know lower level of the uh, of education, let's say, and um, 
And so you can do beach cleanups that create employment, that um, make the beaches prettier, that uh, uh, solve pollution issues, and also drive tourism. And that gets me back to the three Ps, right? So what I just uh, uh, brought up as an example has a people component, has a planet component, and has a profit component because the hotels and the overall tourism industry benefits, right? So... If you look at every problem that way and not just as like, oh, we have to save the planet, then suddenly new ideas come up, right? And it's a little bit the same, but still different when you look at it from a pure uh, business community standpoint here, right? Now, if you're a big organization and if you're especially big organization in Europe, yeah, you actually don't have a choice anymore because the regulations are getting tighter and sooner or later that they'll come to the US as well. And in fact, the Europeans are already uh, uh, making sure that in a couple of years, if you're um, exporting to Europe, you will have to look at these same regulations, yeah? even if you uh, are a company outside of Europe. But so let's let's park uh, regulations for a second. Yeah? Um, if I go back to the three Ps, um, the reason why organizations sh should uh, look at this is not just because somebody else tells you, um, you you should do it, but because actually it is good business. And you could see in the in the public conversation, there's there's been this wave of uh, ESG and ESG investment, etc. And now that has come down, and there's some uh, um, flag that uh, some companies are getting. There's almost like an anti ESG movement. And to me, this is just noise because if you're looking at your environmental impact and you're looking at your social impact and you're looking at how your company is governed, that all adds up to just running a better company, right? So if you if you want to look at it from a big organization standpoint, it's like sustainability in corporations ends up just being the new way of doing business better. Yeah? And therefore, then uh, that has uh, good implications on your stock price and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of your listeners are smaller organizations. So let's just see how we answer that question for uh, SMEs. Yeah? So SMEs often um, are very tight on resources, are tight on budget. A lot of people are multitasking. There's constant pressure. They're either trying to scale up or you know, hyper growth, or maybe some are just in, in survival mode. Yeah? So then the question is like, why should I bother? Why, why is this not just yet another headache that I can postpone? And the answer to that is because you're depriving yourself of certain opportunities. And um, so I have a little presentation that um, you know people can contact me and I'll, I'll happy to share it. Um, it's called the nine ways to create business value from sustainability. Yeah? And it's especially good for, for smaller organizations because they don't necessarily see these connections as obviously. And um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. So organizations that have never looked at their waste uh, their waste disposal, their waste collection, etc. They're depriving themselves of an opportunity to actually save costs. Yeah, usually waste is an inefficiency, and if you can design out that waste, you will actually save money. So, what's not to like that? Uh, not, uh, to not like about that from a, a pure profit standpoint, right? So, it's just one example. Um, the other example is. If you're in the supply chain of a bigger organizations, these big organizations, and the, 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 the most intuitive example here is Walmart. Yeah? If you are a supplier to Walmart one way or another, they have so much pressure on their own to look at their footprint, let's say carbon footprint in this case, that they pass that pressure on to all their brands. Yeah? So if you want to sell at Walmart, then you have to look at it. And if not, they may find somebody else to stock their shelves with. So it becomes something that also is good for keeping your uh, current clients. And then, of course, also to gaining uh, new clients if these clients in the B2B space 
care about this, right? So you can see how there's an ecosystem. Um, and then if you're on the B2C side, there's also changing consumer preferences. Yeah? So there's a whole new generation. Uh, this, this will be familiar to most people that the younger you go on the consumer side, the more people care about it. So with new consumer expectations, then comes the business opportunity to cater to certain parts uh, of the new generation who want greener, cleaner products, who want to buy products from companies who have responsibility. So you can see that there's a lot of business incentives um, that make this something that, while not mandatory, uh, at least uh, as long as uh, regulations are not going to uh, be um, breathing down your neck, while not mandatory, it's just good business. Yeah, Constantine, I'll tell you what, what I'm really hearing from you in so much of today's conversation is not just about, hey, these are our obligations, this is our duty, and I'm not hearing any fear mongering from you today, which I also really appreciate the way that you bring this conversation to the level of the people who are listening to us right now, Constantine, are thousands of listeners from all across the world, over 150 countries tuning in. And what I keep hearing from you is actually that not only is this an initiative that we should care about, but what I'm really hearing is this is a different lens through which we can view our world, our lives, and our businesses. And I think that that lens in these tangible examples that you're offering to us, it actually helps us to find different solutions to real life business problems we're having. And I think that it guides us to make those better decisions. And I love that. And it fits right in with, as I was doing my research ahead of our conversation today, one word that kept popping up in your work is that word of roadmap. Let me help you have a roadmap, which to me speaks to, I mean, it's its all of our inner hearts as entrepreneurs. We love action plans. If you tell us where to go, we will hungrily and determined go there. Talk to us about what that roadmap looks like. And along the way, I know that you and I are geeks about analytics and making things that actually change results. Talk to us about some of those analytics that you have your eyes on when you develop those roadmaps. Yeah, okay. So um, first of all, um, there's plenty of sustainability roadmaps out there, but the majority of them were created for large organizations. Because when you're a listed company, on uh, uh, most uh, stock markets, you now have reporting obligations, right? And so then you get into the habit of, okay, what are those? What do we have to do? Sorry, what do we have to measure? And so on and so forth. Yeah? Those do not necessarily translate that easily to SMEs. Yeah? And so when I say I want to make sustainability everybody's business, there is a very long tail of organizations who haven't even looked at this. And um, what you don't want to do is apply the same exact tools that you're applying for a Unilever or for a Walmart um, to these uh, small and medium-sized companies. Because a, they don't have the means to approach it in the same way, uh, both from an internal resource and external fee standpoint, but also it's not necessary. Yeah? So when I talk about roadmap with SMEs, the first thing is to recognize that you can start small. There's no obligation. Yeah? unless there's some real external pressure because you're maybe dependent on one particular client and they're breathing down your neck. But in most cases, you will not feel these external pressures uh, if you're a smaller company, especially in the US. So, <clears throat> so your roadmap needs to look different. And the first uh, two things I tell everybody is, number one, you can start small. And number two, you can determine the pace at which you move things forward. So what I do, is um, instead of uh, the traditional consulting approach where you are the uh, I know it all um, source of wisdom and you come down from the mountain and you tell people you got to do this and this and this and this, I co-create with the, um, uh, the, 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 the management. And uh, <clears throat> actually not just the management because uh, it's always a good idea to look in your organization for who are uh, what I call the sustainability hand raisers. And those could be even younger people who are in junior positions, right? And so you you, you create a, a, a team together from people who have uh, decision-making power and people who are really passionate about this. And then we actually co-create together. And uh, what we look at is what are the quick wins? Yeah? Because what you don't want is to create some sort of 
three-year plan, five-year plan. This is what you see a lot in uh, in sustainability reporting. Yeah, Because in climate change, so much of it sits on very long trajectories. Then the goals that get defined are 2050 goals, 2030 goals. No SME is really, really interested to dial themselves into this. They're looking at what's the next year, right? So because you don't have these reporting obligations, you actually can do it that way. You just look at the next year. And you determine of all the ideas that we came up with, what should I do in month one? What should I do in month six? And what do I park for year two? And that's when we get into quick wins. And the quick wins, again, they need to feel like they're aligning people, planet, and profit. So <clears throat> I gave one example <clears throat> uh, um, around waste. The other one, of course, is around um, other types of uh, efficiencies, um, for example, in the space of um, electricity, right? And especially now with major, major incentives uh, that have been established, um, you know, looking at renewable energy could be actually another thing that saves you cost, right? So that'll depend a bit uh, on what your needs are and which state you're <clears throat> located in and end. So it's not, uh, none of these are boilerplate uh, solutions, but you first start thinking about, okay, what matters to our business? What is the kind of pool of ideas that we can consider? Then you start sifting through those and you look for these quick wins that are also win-wins, yeah? both from a um, uh, business standpoint and from a people and planet standpoint. Yeah, Constantine, I give you so much credit because I think you have really powerful messaging in this space because it's a real message, one that is really targeted at the people that you're talking to. Because I remember when I lived in California, for example, the state or the city of Los Angeles would always announce those initiatives of, you know, the 2050 initiative. I love that you called that out as an example. And as a business owner, I am 100 percent. I'm I will very publicly state this. I'm not planning for what's going to happen to my businesses in 2050. I can't afford to. So you are bringing us that real thing in a world where I think that so much of the messaging is that kind of holier than thou of we have to be perfect in our actions. But Constantine, you're really bringing it down to that individual, that actionable level, which I so appreciate. I really want to ask you this because in talking so much about sustainability and, and all that's right and wrong with the way that this has been rolled out to the masses, whether it's on a governmental level, a private level, or even a societal level. With your entrepreneurial hat on, I guess talking more to you as, as one of us, Constantine, as a fellow entrepreneur, what has been somewhat surprising to you? Because you had a really awesome career and now as an entrepreneur stepping into that world, what has made you be like, oh, holy cow, I didn't expect entrepreneurship or having my own consultancy to look like this? Okay, let me just be uh, honest with you. This is a lot harder than I envisioned it. Yeah? And um, it is probably because uh, it's a transition on so many levels. Yeah? Obviously, I'm already transitioning from a, a subject matter. Um, and uh, now I could have done the easy uh, thing. Yeah? The easy thing is just to stay to that intersection of sustainability and marketing. But I, I tell you um, why I didn't go there. Um, the, the temptation is, as we said earlier, to just go straight to marketing. Yeah? And sustainability is about actions, is about behaviors in all of us, and it's about corporate actions, yeah? operations, that is. And then you look at uh, your marketing. Yeah? So, so it's a it's a it's a big transition that way. It's also a big transition of I'm used to having a lot of people around me and so on. And now you're like, wow, I got to do everything by myself. I'm my own IT support. I'm my own salesperson, etc. So the amount of different things, uh, you know, the the type of Swiss Army knife you have to become, you know, that was like really interesting to me. And is of course was exciting because it's also a learning journey. Yeah? And then uh, on a more personal level, the the thing I just had to really learn is patience. In fact, I, I came up with another three Ps uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what keeps you going. Um, the first one we already talked about is purpose, yeah? uh, because nobody is uh, breathing down your neck, no boss, no customer. You have to kind of get up in the morning and, you know, do the work. Um, and so 
purpose really helps with that. You know, why do I do this work? Uh, the second uh, P was actually uh, persistence. Yeah? Um, as an entrepreneur, you get uh, uh, the word no a lot. And, uh, you know, no is just a first step towards a yes. So you got to stay on it. Yeah? And the third thing, and that's more a personal thing, is uh, patience. Yeah? Um, I'm a little bit an impatient guy. I like instant gratification. And there's no such thing in entrepreneurship. Yeah? Um, and uh, so be patient and uh, build things up step by step. You know, that was uh, the third P I came up with as, as kind of my three entrepreneurial mantras. Yeah, I love that, Constantine. Again, with the real stuff. This is why I love the guests that we bring on this show, because these are the real entrepreneurial conversations, Constantine. I think it is so revealing that immediately when I asked that question, the first thing that you said was, no, this is harder than I thought, because that's the real stuff that whether you're a entrepreneur or you're an entrepreneur, you need to be reminded of that constantly because we all hope that it's easy. Constantine, I share the impatience with you and it is such a skill that we need to work on. On that note, I always love my last question of every episode to guests is always, what's your one piece of advice for the entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs who are tuning in? I never know where guests are going to bring this answer because we've talked about so many amazing things here today. Today, and I always remind them that you're one of us. What's that one action or insight that you want to share with listeners? Yeah, so I don't know that this is a new one. I think we 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 did uh, mention it, but uh, for me, when you are an employee in a in a big corporation, you know, um, there's so many outside forces on you that you know uh, tell you what to do. Um, and you get wrapped up in, in a routine and there's uh, colleagues, there's bosses, there's customers, etc. Yeah? And when you're an entrepreneur, you really, really need to know why you're doing this. Yeah? So uh, to phrase it slightly differently, uh, how we phrased it uh, before is know your why. And, you know, there's books on this. There's somebody who's quite famous uh, who established this already, but to me, is, is the fundamental uh, starting point of, uh, of every entrepreneur. Yeah? And that why will take you to some impact space because as an entrepreneur, you want to leave a mark on society beyond just making money. Right now, there's lots of people who are jumping on the bandwagon of uh, certain developments. You know, it used to be crypto, now is AI, and but um, this won't last long unless you also defined. Uh, okay, so what I'm actually doing here for the betterment of the world. Yeah? And once you've figured this out, and I think everybody can figure this out regardless of what they're doing, and their impact can be very small and individual or can be on a greater scale. Once you figure that out, I think you have uh, created a foundation that will take you very far. Yes. And along the lines of patience and hardships, I think that is the only thing that gets us through there. It's why I've always loved that concept of the man who enjoys walking will walk far further than the man who simply loves the destination. And Constantine, it's so true in your own journey. You talked about the next 30 years. I'm personally so excited to follow yeah. along with your journey. I know you're out there. Heck, I'm going to be honest and transparent with you. Just reading through your LinkedIn recommendations and what other people say about you speaks volumes to the impacts that not only have you had, but that you're really committed to having on all of society and the planet, not just today, but moving forward. So along those lines, Constantine, for listeners who want to go deeper into your work and just like me, follow along with all the great things that you're up to, drop those links on us. Where should listeners go from here? So, um, <clears throat> so my website is uh, www.impact3p.com, you know, um, quite simple, but I really am a LinkedIn guy. Yeah? So I really encourage everybody to find me on LinkedIn um, because uh, I, I love networking. Um, I also love give out free advice. I mean, you can envision in my work, there's also a component of voluntary work. Yeah, So I do a lot of public workshops uh, because we have to also bring citizens along. Yeah, And uh, so in that, in that sense, like uh, I'm always open um, and I, I say yes to, you know, the vast majority of uh, connection requests and uh, please find me on LinkedIn. And uh, I'm also a partnership guy. Yeah? So we can always figure out how to do things together. Um, uh, you know, between companies, that's also a passion point of mine. 
Yes, listeners, you already know the drill. We are dropping those links down below wherever it is that you're tuning into today's episode. Constantine's business website is at impact3p.com. That's the number three, impact3p.com. We're also linking to his personal LinkedIn. I mean it when I say it. Go connect with him there. He is such a giver. He's so generous. And really what he just alluded to there, you heard how generous he has been with his time and knowledge and experiences and perspectives with us here today. But on top of that, he's an educator at heart. So definitely reach out and connect with Constantine on LinkedIn. You'll find that link down below. Otherwise, Constantine, on behalf of myself and all the listeners around the world, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed our conversation, Brian. Thank you.